Hello, everyone. A very good morning to those who are joining us from Singapore and Asia. And a very warm welcome to all of you joining us from other parts of the world. Thank you for being here with us for today's event on how to build a biotech startup team presented by SG Innovate and the Singapore Consortium for Synthetic Biology. My name is Jin from SG Innovate, and we are a government-owned organization that invests in and helps build deep tech startups, talent, and community. We have been building up and driving deep tech innovations in AI, healthcare, quantum tech, agri-food, autonomous technologies, just to name a few. At SG Innovate, much of our work is to connect the deep tech ecosystem to explore the impact of science and technology in defining our future economy. In today's session, our panel of experts will be sharing hiring advice to startups trying to build a successful team, their experience building a biotech startup team, and the various opportunities and success factors that have helped them in their team building journey. During the session, we encourage you to engage with our speakers and presenters by submitting your questions in the Q&A box located on the lower panel of your screen. Without further ado, I would like to invite our moderator for this discussion, Dr. Konstantinos Babitsas from Synergy, to start us off. Kostas, please. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining on this session. I am uh, very happy to have uh, a nice panel with us and talk about uh, entrepreneurship. Before that, I will have to present um, and uh, publicize, give some noise to our upcoming events. So for those who don't know, uh, Synergy is uh, a tech consortium funded by National Research Foundation. And our aim is to help uh, facilitate collaborations between academic and uh, industry in the field of synthetic biology. And uh, if you want to see us in person, first event you can do that is uh, next Tuesday at 11 a.m. You can come to the NUS campus and we have a seminar with uh, our industry partner GenScript about antibody engineering. One week after that, we have a symposium with our industry partner, Twist Biosciences, uh, where we want to discover the future of synthetic biology. So on the 31st of May, we have a stellar panel uh, consisting of uh, Emily Leproust, the CEO of Twist Bioscience, and uh, uh, Chue Lupo from NUS, Serene Lim from NDU, and Yi Kui Lim from ASTAR, who together will have a nice discussion about what the future of synthetic biology will bring. Both events include freelance and they have limited spaces, so you can find registration information in a, a Synergy webpage, which I hope my colleagues from SG Innovate will link in the chat in a bit. On the 22nd of June, we have another physical event that's a Young Symbio SG Scientific Symposium. So, Symbio SG is a an association promoting synthetic biology in Singapore, and we are proud to support this uh, event aimed uh, mostly at uh, students, undergraduate and postgraduate, where we'll have some interactive ideas and uh, sessions about synthetic biology. But now coming back to our today's event, which is how to build a startup biotech, a biotech startup. Uh, for this event, I have the pleasure to introduce you two of our uh, Synergy members. One is Allozymes and the CTO co-founder at Bahiti, which I will go shortly. Uh, John Bester, who is the CEO and founder of uh, Peptobiotics. And uh, to get another perspective, uh, we have uh, Dr. Wen Chi Ho from uh, Lyson BC, who will tell us how it's, things look from her side. And I will stop sharing my screen and then I will go directly. Well, so who should I go first? Ladies first, right? Uh, Wenchi, would you like to tell us what is uh, Lightstone doing and uh, what is your opinion in, uh, in creation in biotech? Yeah, well, thanks for having us, having me here today. Uh, good to see you, Constance. Um, maybe a quick introduction on Lightstone. We are a global venture fund. Uh, we are early stage life science focused. We have offices in the US, uh, Ireland, as well as in Singapore. And in total, we have 850 million under management across four funds. So in terms of our investment thesis, we are focused on therapeutically driven technology. And that is uh, anywhere covering devices as well as drugs. And in particular, we are looking for innovative uh, technology platforms. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, as a quick, plug, a quick introduction for myself, I'm a scientist by training, did my PhD in immunology, and I joined Lightstone back in 2016 when the Singapore office was started. 
And that's since then I've been involved in investing in as well as venture creating uh, biotech startups in Singapore. Can I ask you a question? So in the event phase, we say that it is said that investors put their money behind people and not ideas. Is that true from your point of view? I would say it's 50-50. <laughs> you need people and you need ideas. If not, no, it's a little difficult to get, get anywhere. But uh, but you're you're right. No, people, people really is one of the as we'll discuss later, right? Team, the founders, the people behind the entire project. That that's really one of the key elements in having a successful startup. We'll go more into that later. But let's go to Akbar Bahiti, who is a founder of Allozymes. Akbar, can you tell us how, what Allozyme is doing, how you started and uh, where you are right now? Hi, Kostas, um, and hi to everyone. Nice meeting you virtually. Hopefully next time we will meet in person. And please let me know if my voice is not clear. So uh, I have a brief introduction about uh, myself and allozymes. Uh, I have a PhD in biocatalysis. By training and chemical engineering, I got my bachelor's and I directly studied PhD after that. I came to Singapore more than 10 years ago and got my PhD in NUS and then I followed uh, in the same field uh, in my postdoc and when I was doing my postdoc, we started this very interesting project for enzyme engineering platform using macrophotic technologies, which was a collaboration between uh, four departments in NUS. And I was the lead researcher and my prof, Prof Lee G was the lead PI of the project. We got a fund from NRF. And after two years, we patented the technology. So I decided to leave and then kind of be the entrepreneur. And I had a friend, batch of friends, they were entrepreneurs. Uh, we founded Allozymes two years back. So Allozymes basically does enzyme engineering as a core technology, but applies it for synthetic biology and any other application for biocatalysis and other types of fermentation, uh, strain development and improvements. And uh, we use microproduct technology because it gives us edge over the traditional uh, plate base or uh, say robotic systems. We are much faster than them and more cost efficient than like Penix at least faster in development time. This is a brief introduction about us. Uh, I'm happy to discuss more. So you mentioned that uh, one of the key points was uh, your a relationship with a co-founder with uh, Payman, actually. Um, yep. Do you think you would uh, embark on this journey without the co-founder? Mm, I think we have a person in the room that you can also comment. For me, mm, the pace is different. So I think if if you are first-time founder, it's really difficult. Uh, you have to go through a lot. Uh, and normally, even though in the beginning we worked together, very much almost in every task, but slowly we deviate a lot. Like uh, often nowadays we don't meet each other some days at least. And uh, that means we do a lot of different things. And I can imagine if one person is going to do that, it, things will be much slower or will be in different direction because uh, yeah, you may think uh, uh, in one way and your co-founder can contribute more in the other way and you can decide better. But uh, it doesn't mean uh, solo founders can't do that, but it's just uh, more tough and it needs a little bit more experience or you have to really gain it with some pain, I think. <laughs> okay, then let's go to the solo founder who will tell us his uh, experience. So John, would you like to tell us where, how you started Petrobiotics and uh, where you are right now? Sure, well, uh... Thanks for having me, Costas, and good to see you all guys. Our origins are pretty shrouded in mystery, but essentially I became quite interested in the use of antibiotics in livestock agriculture. So in 2019, 1.2 million people died from antibiotic-resistant bacteria-associated infections. And that number is going up every year. It's almost like having a COVID pandemic every year, but without the panic. Um, and what's causing all these antibiotic-resistant bacteria is the overuse of antibiotics. And at the moment, 80% of antibiotics are used in livestock to make the animal grow faster, you get a more productive agricultural system. But you also have more 
antimicrobial resistance. So I became interested in studying a company in this space. Uh, my background, I was at Oxford. I worked a lot in like plant genetic modification and trying to make better varieties of plants, which would be more drought resistant, that kind of thing. Um, and then also in white biotechnology, so different microbial hosts and backgrounds. And what I realized is that we're not really using biotechnology to disrupt animal agriculture as much as we are in kind of traditional uh, crops or, or white biotechnology. So I was looking for ideas in that area. Uh, originally, I came over to Singapore with the intention to make genetically modified probiotics. Uh, it's a big topic in some research institutes at Singapore and around the world. As we got deeper into the regulations and started to work with partners, we realized that a genetically modified probiotic is a non sequitur for regulators. Uh, and we also realized that we could be much more economical if we produced uh, recombinant peptides, which is what we focus on in highly controlled fermentation conditions. And we could have much more economical titers. So what our company focuses on now is producing uh, small antimicrobial peptides and immunomodulatory peptides. And we do that using precision fermentation and we feed it to different animal species to make them grow faster and more productively. At the moment, we have three different uh, like lead candidates against three different targets, and they're going into trials over the next six months. Uh, I'm here today mostly to try and reach out. We're looking for you know, smart, uh, enterprising people who want to join startup companies, particularly in the areas of bioprocess and synthetic biology. Uh, so if that's of interest to you, please do reach out to me afterwards. It would be great to get in touch. Thank you for... Uh... Well, your pitch, it was kind of a pitch, right? And then it leads me to my next question quite easily. So when you do a pitch to an investor or to a potential customer, um, you, of course, uh, describe the problem statement as you did right now, and uh, maybe something about your technology or something about why you're great at it. How much emphasis do you put in your uh, team composition? Yeah, I think especially at early stage like us, team is, well, maybe when she can answer this better, but my, my sense is that most investors are mostly interested in the team because your idea will evolve and change over time. I tend to close with the team. So I do my pitch and explain the story and then I will finish on the team as like a strong point to try and kind of seal the messaging. Can I ask the same question to Akbar? How much emphasis do you put on the team? Mm, to me, definitely team is uh, the most important part of the early stage seed and pre-seed, I would say. Mm, but uh, there's a bit of tricky question here because we are talking about biotech. And mm, I know from experience and talking in other places, I know that IP also plays a very important role in biotech. It can be in the different forms, but mm, just having idea sometimes in biotech doesn't go well normally. So I think biotech still needs a strong IP or at least some good development around it. And team is definitely is a must, but yeah, IP is also very crucial to my understanding. Yeah, but a team is for every startup, I would say not just biotech, like it's all about execution and team is the one who's executed. When, uh, when you see an investment pitch or a presentation or when you talk to a potential you know, partner, um, what are the team composition elements that you look into? Uh, how do you assess that the team is a good or a not good enough to proceed? Mm, that's, a, that's a trick question, but <laughs> I'll, I'll answer with, with uh, when, when we first no, first impressions count a lot, right? So, and, and the first time you meet a team is usually during the pitch that they you know, present to the investment firm. So I would say with first impressions plus team composition, you know, the first thing they see is who is presenting, how are they presenting? Are they actually get, get, getting the message across clearly in a very effective way? And uh, are they convincing? So that's the first impression of team already. And, and, and to, I mean, that's, that's a skill to be learned. It's not easy to translate si simply from a, you know, a, a typical scientific uh, presentation style to a pitch, you no know, commercially savvy um, business um, context for pitch. So aside from that, you know, after the, if you can get over the, uh, the five second attention span that, that VCs have, 
then next comes the slides themselves and we actually sell the, the, the value of your technology. And, and at that point, you know, the composition of the team does matter a lot because, um, you know, VCs tend to like to back uh, seasoned teams or teams that have been there, done that before. So of course, you know, we, we, it's difficult to expect that every, every team that comes through will be, you know, seasoned biotech professionals or entrepreneurs. So if we are looking at first time founders, there are certain qualities we're looking for. And there, that goes back into how they present themselves as well, right? Which is, you know, do they show that they are coachable? Do, do they, are they open and willing to, do we get a sense that they're open and willing to learn from advisors or investors from the commercial and business front? Are they adaptable? And that, and and also whether or not they truly have a good grasp on their uh, technology and their expertise in the area. So all these are things that slowly seep out, you know, as the team is presenting, and that's how, you know, at least from our point of view, we see whether or not team one composition wise is, you know, is, is suitable to be backed, as well as whether or not the um, the technology is is worthwhile to be backed. Okay, and but uh, the team changes, right? So um, one question I will ask the founders, let's start with John, is uh, how did your team evolve over time? So, and this did it follow the team composition, uh, what you had in mind, the way that your company would grow? Yeah, I think it's mostly gone according to the master plan. It's interesting because up until this point, we were mostly just doing molecular biology in the lab and all of the startups activities were around lab work. But now that we're moving more towards like scaling up the manufacturing and trying to make that for our first customers, we've had to hire entire new teams for bioprocess. So I think integrating the bioprocess people, almost all of whom are international with the existing team and how does that work? Do they go through my, my R&D manager or do they report directly to me? These kind of things have been probably our biggest speed bump. Uh, but overall, I think, as, as we go through the next funding round, we bring on commercial people, there'll be new arms to the startup and it should all, all come together, yeah. What about you, Alvar? How did the Alzheimer's evolve? Yeah, it's a, a short but very complicated story because we evolved very fast, I would say. We were three people last gen and this gen we were like 15 almost. And now we are more than that. And so, uh, but I think the key is to know what you need, what, what you are going to build, and what uh, skill sets you will require in the different timelines. So, if you know these things or plan these things, or even if you plan and get different feedback from your patient and you just quickly revise your plan. And, so hiring will be better, I mean, more effective, but the process itself is quite uh, tedious and time consuming, especially when it comes to the really good talent uh, or like the high quality ones. Uh, so uh, we evolved uh, pretty fast in some ways, but it means we spend so much more time of ourselves to really build that side of it. It's, it doesn't come with, uh, just routine effort to, to expand the team fast, especially in biotech. To my surprise, when I started in Singapore, mm, I thought we will have very strong talent in every aspect, but it's in just certain aspects and not every aspect. Uh, the reason simply is we don't have industrial biotech here much, I should not say known yet. And most of the are startups and mostly academic background or some in the biopharma, yes, we have some, but those are really not so much of the bio biotechnology or industrial biotech. So that is a challenge in Singapore. That's why even now we have a global team. We have from Europe, the two full-time people and we are just adding more. Lovely. Wenchi, uh, let's say that you invested already in a company and uh, you have your team, it's going. Have you had any, how do you help the company evolve its team together with the technology and the IP portfolio or related to that? Yeah, I mean, Lightstone, we are actually very much involved as a venture creator. Right? So taking, taking some excerpts from a couple of companies we co-founded and created in Singapore, we, 
with the outs at the outset, no, it's exactly as John mentioned, right? You know, a lot of the team will be very scientifically focused, you know, looking at you know, building the technology, demonstrating proof of concept or the technology before you know, we can actually launch into more of the business end of things. At that even at the early outset, we are always on the lookout for business savvy scientists right, who can actually translate or bridge the gap between academia and business. And like Akbar mentioned, uh, there are few and far between these such individuals because mainly as exactly the, the point he mentioned, there are just not that many um, big pharma or even biotechs here that are more established that provides a kind of uh, foundational training for a lot of academic scientists as they embark into the industrial side of, uh, of the house. So without that, then it really comes down to back to looking for the key key characteristics there is uh, adaptability, you know, aptitude, you know, excitedness about being in a startup, and willingness to learn and and training them from the ground up, you know, with the business app, business intention to help them uh, make that transition. So at that outset, you know, as as a venture investors uh, or venture creators, we actually play a a day-to-day -day operational role with the team. So we guide the team along um, as part of, as I guess, um, interim chronicles management of sorts um, and, and work with the team that way. And as it as the team grows or as the company grows and technology you know, matures, that's when we need to start looking into having you know, folks who have been there, done that, or seasoned management who come in. And these are the people who will be able to help the company you know, pitch for a, a much larger series A raise or series B raise down the line. And that's where we rely a lot on our networks. So uh, we, we look through the traditional um, channels to right, you know, find recruiters, get help with finding the right management for the right team, as well as uh, going through our networks the, amongst the VCs, as well, as well as our other portfolio companies for people who might fit the bill. And on the on the on the scientific staff level, uh, we will we also work very closely with our, our companies to expand upon the, uh, the the technical expertise on the ground because our one of our our goals is to try and build the discovery units here that will have that will then be able to see further future companies down the line of for Singapore in the Singapore biotech scene. But in a nutshell, it's a, it's a real laborious process and it takes a lot of sifting through CVs and, and hunting for people through LinkedIn and, and every way and shape, manner or form they can think of. It's, it's, we, we do it together with our companies and, and that's how we can get fine people. And even then, the hit rate is still pretty low. <laughs> okay. And I'll start some allowed to field questions. You uh, can field some yeah. questions. What, Wenchin and Akbar, what are your secret techniques for finding like great people for your teams? Um, what have you found to be high ROI? <laughs> Especially That's you, Akbar. Trait. You guys find so many great people and you convince them to move here. And Thank how do you, you do for it? That compliment. Yeah. I think um, that's uh, similar to what he mentioned. It's like how investors interact with uh, basically founders. I think founders also in similar way interact with the good uh, quali quality people and it should be good impression from both sides, good understanding of the problem. Because uh, to me, they are very good quality people. It's difficult to convince them, but after that, they are autopilot. Like once you convince them, you show the vision and the vision of company. They they look more for those things than just mm -hmm. small uh, job scope or these kind of things, right? And they are very much into the growth or potential of the company. So these things needs to be well explained and discussed. So we we had many, many meetings with those profiles that you can see we have added. It's not just with one interview and second interview or offer letter, it just doesn't go that way. It's kind of a little bit of relation and then you can get them in. So, but again, it doesn't mean for other layers, uh, you don't need to spend time. In fact, uh, we are even sometimes even now struggling in the assistant levels, technician levels, I'm just being honest. So. Every level, it means spending time, but I agree uh, for the highest profile, you need the, the most effort in the beginning, but after that, it becomes much smooth. So we have um, some very good profile people join, which normally in city stage is difficult, but we really spend time on it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think I absolutely agree. It comes down to you know, having the right vision, right? Because the best folks look for companies that they feel they can they can add value to and that they have the right expertise and they can see a future of this company growing into something with their with with them in it. 
And uh, I think the, when we were able to attract people, it's usually with a really strong founders you know, that can actually sell the technology really well, attracts the, the, the future candidate, and as well as a strong syndicate behind it, you know, like the, the that they, they can they are rest assured that you know, there is a group of investors who are committed to building this company together, mm-hmm. as well as uh, eventually and the composition of the current team. Right? And I don't I think that's something that all all uh, more senior candidates will come in and look. Okay, who are, who do we have in the company? Can I work with them? Do I have chemistry with every single one of them? And especially do I have chemistry with the founders or the leaders of the team? And that's a that's a yeah, I think really important piece the relationship building and it's a courtship right it takes a long time to get people involved and they slowly get to know everybody and at the end of the day it comes down to you know is that something they're willing to take a plunge with? Okay, we all know that Singapore has a high turnover of employees. So the other question is, how do you keep the good people you hired in your company? Yeah. John. You want to start? How do you keep? Uh, how do you make your employees happy? Uh, I don't know if I make them happy, but uh, we challenge them, and I think they like the challenge and the autonomy. Like all great engineers, hate bureaucracy, and I also hate bureaucracy. So we get scientists money, and then we let them work on something challenging that actually works, and they feel progress, and that's compelling. So we've been around only for a year and a half, and I haven't had any employees drop off. Uh, only interns. So I'm probably not the best person to answer this question. I imagine uh, when we come to the point that somebody wants to leave, uh, probably some of the things we're trying to do at the moment is like provide more structure with like progression for people. Like it's a startup and it's like really wild west. No one knows like exactly where they'll end up in the future. Um, will they get the leadership role that we kind of promise them when they, they join a startup company and they expect it to expand? So as we're kind of working towards series A at the moment, we're trying to get more clear roadmaps for everybody, what their job is going to look like in two years' time, make sure it remains compelling for them. Akbar, same question. How do you make your employees happy? Mm, Yeah, that's a good question. I think that's also a challenging question. Like, I would say if founders completely know that, they would be very happy. (laughs) But... um, also, we are a young company. Normally, the retention, you should like, evaluate within like two years' time. But as John said, yeah, we, we didn't have so far anyone like resigning or dropping, but we are still young, right? So what we do, uh, because one uh, concern we have that we are growing relatively fast. So we are uh, in, initially, when all of you can go under one roof and in a room, you can fit in. So that's easier to handle because you can have close relation, you can manage them, you can sense a lot of changes. So that is more uh, of that. But uh, while the team is growing, these things will just go out of your reach. So you cannot really manage that way. And we are building structure. I think John briefly mentioned also that uh, how they can progress, what, what to expect, what this company is heading and how they can contribute in. Uh, also, the um, ownership, I think, is important for startup employees. So we give that uh, feeling to them by uh, the tools that we have so that they can understand the challenges that they are facing is also benefiting them if they solve. It's not just a normal job. For us, startup job difference with the established companies, you you help company grow, so it helps you grow also benefit in some ways also. So, and that is a big difference from established companies, which if you just do a routine job, everybody's happy with you. But then in startups, you can fall or you can grow much faster. So we try to convey this message clearly and also establish infrastructure for it so they can see the clear impact of it. And also, as I said, we interact as frequent as possible. We have uh, internally some rules that we discuss with team much frequent, I would say, from compared to many other companies. I want to ask, uh, Wenji, when are there any red flags that you're looking for to see a team that is not functioning well and then uh, maybe that will trigger you to intervene and try to either mediate or take some drastic action. And uh, what is your strategy to solve? 
conflict or <laughs> drama, let's say? Well, I think team is a team is a very broad term, right? So it can mean the management team, can mean the founder team, can mean everyone up and down an entire company team. So so far we've been actually really um, lucky on the or lucky with the founders. So we've had a really solid group of founders that we've been working with. You know, they've been all very collegial. They work very well together. And to begin with, they were all friends and colleagues. So they, they know each other well. So moving into a startup environment where a lot, some of them moved in the company, some of them stay in their day jobs, but there's still a lot of communication amongst the founders with the company. We haven't had any, any, um, any friction there or conflict to resolve. Um, but of course, um, with the, with the, with the rest of the, um, with conflicts that can, can conflicts can happen in the company itself with, I don't know, and it can happen with all shapes and sizes of the company. And especially with a start company where it's very stressful, there's a lot of tension ongoing and, and limited, very sh short timelines, limited resources. Uh, we, we had, we've had to, in certain situations, had come in to mediate a few conflicts so between you know, some of the, between staff and, and uh, between, yeah, between some of the staff. And it's, it's a matter of uh, you know, sitting everybody down, making sure that everyone is on the same page, because at the end of the day, it's a very small team, right? You know, startups are, are not you know, 100 people strong, at least not yet, the 100 man team. It's a small group that everyone has to work very well together. If not, we will not go anywhere. And, and it's about bringing that vision back home again, right? You know, the vision, why did you join this company to begin with? Why were, why were you interested in to join this company to begin with? And actually making sure that everyone's on the same page. And it's, it's not an easy process. It takes a few you know, counseling sessions. And it's more counseling than, than any sort of um, conflict resolute, conflict management, more and making sure that everyone sees the greater vision and sees how the other person looking at it and trying to get everybody back on the same side. And then you know, we're all playing on the same team. We all want the same goals. Let's work together to get it moving in the right direction. Hey, we have a nice question that we uh, we have been focusing a lot on uh, the team and employees and the founders, of course, and a bit uh, of uh, um, you know how day to day operations work. But what about the advisory boards? So there's a question from Emmanuel, which is uh, uh, how do you select uh, and how do you compensate your advisory board? And I will enrich the question and say how do you find a good advisory board member. So what do you expect from them? Uh, John, maybe you can start. Uh, well, I like this question because I'm very, uh, I'm a big fan of advisory board, basically. And what you do when you're in a small biotechnology startup is you spend a lot of time reaching out to like esoteric experts around the world and trying to convince them to have a phone call with you so you can learn like what they know and how it helps your company. And we do this every week. And over time, we often develop relationships with those people. If we see them providing ongoing benefit to the startup, then we might bring them on board for our advisory board. So our advisory board has four people that have equity where we've given them a small bit of ownership in the company. Uh, I don't think you should do that lightly. I think a lot of startups you know, do that really early on because they want to show investors they have advisors. Uh, I think you should only do that if you're like talking to them at least once a month and they're, they're providing like tangible benefit. Um, and then in addition to that, we have a lot of people who we still speak with regularly, but they're just interested in what we're doing and want to have a conversation and they don't necessarily uh, need ownership or, or want ownership. So I think uh, it's mostly been organic um, with one exception. Uh, there was one particular area that we were working on early on. We wanted to license out a technology from a specific university and research group. Uh, and so in that case, we actively kind of courted him and brought him on as an advisor so we could get access to that technology and keep developing it with him and he would have some incentive to help the company. Akbar, same question. Yeah, but for advisory, as um, uh, we all know, it evolves like a team to me. But of course, um, early days, you always try to push to talk to them because um, team building needs money in some ways, but advisory people still, if they like your ideas or your personality, some of these advisors will early on support you. And I think uh, it is a good indicator of good advisors. I totally agree that advisors shouldn't just be a name or just come and join because you're offering ownership. 
they should show that they have interest and they are supporting you and you really benefiting from them. And then it's just a mutual agreement how to continue from there. We have also three advisors currently. We are also uh, working to expansion. Uh, we don't have like advisory board as in like a board that they sit together and or meet together and discuss because I think that's a bit more mature state of the company should come. Mm -hmm. But our advisors, we basically tap into them when we meet, but regularly. So we have very regular meetings with them. Some of them involve even if needed to some of operational matters and they give advice. So yeah, to me, advisors can be very important in early days. As the team evolves, as you bring uh, more experienced people, uh, you can start slowly focusing on your own team and advisors will be just like support side. But early days, they can even help you to really build things or really discuss more details. Okay, and uh, what about, uh, since we are on this, what about the PI, since you were a university spin-off in a sense, is the PI involvement important or uh, not really in this case, in your case, what is your experience? Uh, I think because we have two uh, phases of our technology, so we had our technology developed in university, right? which many startups start from idea. And that's why I just mentioned in the first uh, uh, point that I said IP is important. So our PIs or those academic people contributed in this idea, basically in that IP that was developed and we did uh, some good developments in that time. But in my opinion, PIs can play a small role in commercialization unless they have really experience and heavy interest. Otherwise, they will be quite busy with their own job, which is not easy job. Like they have to teach, they have to uh, train their PhDs, masters, take care of lab, right? Uh, grants. So that's their main job. And yeah, so we, our, our path was we wanted to build our facilities and work independently as possible. So we didn't go to that path of giving some big chunk of company to academic people just to get some experiment done because some companies do that, but we didn't do it. Uh, but I, uh, I would say there are uh, PIs that are very interested and they want to uh, spend time on commercial aspects. I have talked and seen them. Yes, depends. There's no uh, yes or no. It just depends on the profile of person you are talking about. And in Singapore, it's starting to pick up because uh, there's a push from the even grants like for translations and commercialization, but it wasn't there a few years ago, I would say even. So, but if you see sometimes US, um, they have like good number of very successful uh, professor entrepreneurs that they have spin up companies and they supported really throughout. So it depends, yeah, there's no like, it's, if it's academic, you cannot work, but it depends how much time and expertise and knowledge they can bring in commercialization side as well, because uh, I am technical person and we have a set of technical people. We need also more commercial aspects that comes from commercial people. I have a question from Matthew that uh, Matthew Tate that wants to elaborate a bit on uh, the ways to find talent. And then I will ask all of you to tell me uh, which is the one method that you really works for you, like in order to find a good team member, like LinkedIn, attending conferences, going through interns, and one method that you thought it would be fruitful, but really doesn't work in Singapore context. So when she... Hmm. So before I understand, understand the question, maybe just one quick plug on the advisory board piece, right? So sure, absolutely. Beyond beyond all the great interaction the company can have with the advisory board, from the investor point of view, how we look at a company can also be uh, swayed by like, or, or augmented by how we how the advisory board is built up. Because one way of looking at it is if you can convince the top KOL in this space to be on your advisory board, there must be something great about your company and technology too. So you know, being able to build a strong advisory board in the area of, of your expertise or what you're working on is, is definitely a, a very strong point to have, right? And, and helps coalesce around the team as well uh, as a good sales pitch around the team too. And, uh, and, and lastly, you know, what we've heard from several different um, 
serial entrepreneurs or serial founders, right, that one of the first things they like to do with, um, when they start a company is to make sure that they have a top KOL in every aspect of the company. So if they're working on biology, they have chemistry or in those specific types of technologies within the company, they want to make sure that they have a KOL on their advisory board on every aspect to once again showcase right, that they are very thoughtful founders, a thoughtful management team. They have gone through many They've gone through, they have deep networks in the in the ecosystem. They know who to pick out and they have, have a very well-known, reputable people behind them. Yeah, so that's just a quick plug on advisory boards. Absolutely, yes. And uh, do you think, um, does the advisory board ensure success in your point of view? I'm sorry? Great. Let's say you have a great, amazing advisory board. Does it ensure success or? No, oh, I... Really? I... <laughs> Well, I, I mean, success comes from many different pieces, right? You know, team is one piece, advisory board, giving the right advice is another, as well as technology. And, and sometimes there's, there's an element of things you can't control, which is science, right? You know, sometimes science just doesn't work out and yeah. not much you can do there. But you can pivot. And, yes, absolutely. And then let's move to the question from Matthew. Uh, which methods do you think are really effective into finding good team members like LinkedIn, con calling, friends, network. And tell me, if I've last called of you, one method that you thought it would be good, but it doesn't really work in your experience. In Singapore context, of course. Let's start with Kunchi. Yeah, so when we have searched for people, um, the best way that we found that the, it's the most high quality people with the right tech, uh, technical expertise is through personal networks. So people that we know of have worked with them before that that gives us a layer of added um, comfort that you know, somebody we trust has worked with this person before and, and has vouched for this person's capability and you know, integrity and, and willingness to learn and being part of an and start an ecosystem. When you cold call and we interview people, people say all kinds of things through interviews, right? And it's hard to know what's true and what's you know, being puffing up at that moment itself. But if it's through a personal connection and somebody vouches for this individual, we tend to take that more seriously. And so def definitely, I think that's the best route to, to go after. <laughs> and one route that we found, uh, we thought would work a lot better, but it hasn't really worked out that well. It's actually through, um, uh, especially for the management level, like C-suite folks, when we're looking for CEOs, CSOs, and CMOs, right? It's uh, looking through recruiters have been a little more challenging and nothing, it's not, not something, nothing on the recruiters itself is simply because of you know, having people to move across the globe for these very, uh, for management positions is challenging. And that's a challenge that we face continually. How do we actually attract uh, management C-suite folks with, with a lot of experience and are willing to take on a really young startup that's halfway across the globe, for example. So, but, so, but that's another, that's another big hairy issue that we can talk about later, <laughs> a later time. John, what works for you and what doesn't work for you? Uh, we found people from all kinds of different avenues. And I guess one general thing I'd say is like, don't judge the potential person based on the route that you got them. I've had amazing people come through LinkedIn. Uh, two of our best people came from other founders who referred them. Uh, great people come from all different kinds of places. So I just focus on doing as many interviews as I can because you don't really know until you speak to someone and actually gauge them in person. Um, but yeah, I think one hack which has worked well recently, which might be less common, is spam different startups and different labs and tell them that you're offering a substantial referral fee if they can give you someone great. Uh, we recently got someone through this and I think it's worked well. Um, so that's, that's worked well for us. In terms of stuff which hasn't worked um m mostly just some some job boards out there uh you can spend a lot of time trying to put all your jobs on these other job boards but most of the good people seem to come through linkedin in our case anyway akbar what is your experience especially when you try to recruit people from abroad yeah, yeah um, for us uh, we had Little success, uh, especially in technical roles by job, by job postings. Like we have hired definitely, but most of the good hires or um, the most of the big portion of the team comes in the senior positions comes from uh, LinkedIn. And basically, as I mentioned, just headhunting or chatting or 
through our own network and LinkedIn that we went through and discussed with them over the time and they joined us. But um, we also tapped into come like as you know, wait, this year, like we are attending the meeting, the IDA platform, they have a nice summation and infinity program. Infinity, we just participated, but uh, a summation we have been in three rounds. Um, we had uh, at least one or two uh, people joined us through those programs as well. So yeah, there's no a single method. Uh, if you focus on one method, definitely you will lose out some other good people out there. But uh, for high tech and deep tech, uh, it seems they are quite active in LinkedIn and is really a good uh, channel to focus on apart from uh, your network of people that they can recommend you. But also, I mean, uh, as I said, you should be really knowing what you want because people can recommend based on uh, certain personalities or certain experience, but in different type of projects. If it's not really matching well, you may just focus on that recommendation and take them, but it may not work. So basically, I don't think we will take anyone that we receive not a good recommendation, <laughs> but uh, still you, you will know when you are working with them and you will see like how they are basically performing. So it's very dynamic, but channels to me for deep tech companies, uh, LinkedIn is there and you should really spend time on LinkedIn. We use LinkedIn quite, I would say, um, professionally. We have a subscription and other tools that they provide. No one mentioned conferences and uh, physical meetings. I because mean, it was off last two years. We are going conference. Exactly. There was no conference last two years. Did you attend any? <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying. We all I mean, we're all waiting for the synergy drinks night. You know, less synergy seminars, <laughs> yes. more synergy drinks. Lance, so far, so you can join us 24th, uh, 31st, and the 22nd of June. So you're all welcome. It's free, and uh, you meet some nice, talented people eager to work in biotech. For sure, yeah, we're looking forward for that because it was all over just virtual meetings, which you know how it goes and how you can connect. Yes. But just what my experience, all the jobs that I had, uh, I applied uh, to several jobs in the past for through open openings like uh, job advertisements, and but all the jobs that I had were through personal network. Usually there was uh, some opening that I knew, and they also give gave me some assurance that the person I will work with uh, is, you know, I have an idea of how will I work with that person. Let's go through the questions. Um, Angelica, um, I think I will twist a bit with the question from Angelica to make it a bit more relevant to the topic. Um, so when you start during the conceptualization, do you start forming a team according to your technology or according to the market? Let me explain what I mean. Uh, do you think uh, first, uh, like, uh, how will your product reach the market and you start uh, getting insights about uh, that part, like the downstream, or you first think about your technology and your technical needs, and then you fill up the boxes about marketing leads and team composition, HR, later? Um, let's ask uh, reverse order. Let's ask uh, Jonathan. Mm, I'm not sure if I understand the question. Could you rephrase that? Yes, I uh, already rephrased it. Uh, but uh, so do you start when you have a team, do you initially, uh, you start a company, do you start with the thinking of how will the company develop its technology and then you fill up the roles and boxes? Or do you think about, oh, how will we reach the market and then take this, let's say bottom up approach or top down approach, market approach or uh, technical scientific approach? Okay, uh, I guess we do both, um, both are pretty relevant. The market demands determine the technological requirements. So we work on both simultaneously. Uh, Akbar? I think that's a good question. Uh, I, for our experience, we had a technology developed and, uh, but 
also bear in mind when we were developing that we had a partners from big pharma. So we were receiving uh, their feedback. We were working on industrial relevant enzymes in our case. So it wasn't about publication that suddenly we want to turn it to a company. It was about an industrially relevant uh, technology. So, uh, but uh, to me, technology, the core technology in biotech is very difficult to change. I mean, example, you are working on drug, you cannot jump and become an enzyme company suddenly. It's not like software companies that they can just from one market or idea to go to another. But uh, uh, I think Jonathan's experience was interesting that he mentioned he started with uh, some different aspect of it and he moved to other way of implementing it and technically like fermenting it. So that's the way you, you need to know the market very well. And based on that, so for us, we started uh, very much exploring pharma companies to work with them and we kind of walked away. Now we don't have in our list any pharma. For now, it's, it doesn't mean we will not go back to that. So it, it's just because we learned some lessons that we said, okay, market doesn't work that way. We have to go the other way. But technology is there. And also technology can really go different ways. Uh, you can expand it in different angles or verticals based on market demands. So I think market really drives the development in a way. Uh, Wincy, similar question to you, but uh, let me repeat. Do you usually try to populate the team with uh, technical competences or with market or other soft skill competences? Well, I, I think all points that the other two panelists have mentioned, it's a bit of a continuum. When you're first starting out, you know, it's all about it's more so about trying to make sure your technology fulfills what it needs to do. But even at that early outset, you need to have a good idea where you're going to point your technology to. Is it to you know, consumer-based health or are you going to for a therapeutic-based, uh, you know, which requires a lot of regulatory hurdles, et cetera, down the line? And that kind of skews how you find your technical stuff as well as the operations staff and broadly speaking in the, in the, in the group, right? And, and so those are all conversations that need to start even at the early outset of any uh, company creation. And, but of course, at the early outset, you know, I would say maybe it'll be more weighted towards finding the right technical staff to make sure that your science can move fast and can be nimble and, and be able to demonstrate the proof of principle and have you know, some smaller portion of folks looking at the broader strategy and down the line, what kind of markets would you need to go into? How do you actually get your drug or product to that particular market? And as the technology matures, then it becomes more so of um, finding more and more people who can actually, you know, maybe you need BD folks on the table at that point in time, or we need you know, more regulatory folks. And, and that will skew how you actually recruit the team down the line. But yeah, I would say it's a bit of a continuum that you have to think of at all stages of the development. Do you consider customers part of the team? That's the question. Potential customers. Do you consider them a part of the team? Uh, John, let's start with you. Uh, no, I don't. I think uh, we work pretty closely with customers, but the relationship between our team members is uh, much deeper than it would ever be between us and the customer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, same. I mean, there is different, uh, basically, narratives when you are talking to team and to the customer. So it, it, it I think it doesn't mean they're not important. They're, they are the, the most important, <laughs> maybe. But uh, they, they are different, right? You cannot group them up. Um, Okay, Wenchi, do you think uh, the companies of your portfolio consider you guys as part of their team or a necessary evil? <laughs> <laughs> that is also a trick question, but <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, for the most part, when, when it's a company that we have venture created, I think at the outset, you know, we are very much so working hand in hand with the, with the founders and with the early team. And uh, I, I hope they see us as part of the team because we, we, we do almost everything together right? from from identifying which markets to go into, to hiring people all the way down to nitty gritty of you know, payroll, finances, et cetera, are all together as a group, as the unit together. Um, but of course, as the, as the company grows and they, they get their own um, 
they gather around their own independent management team. Then we start taking our, our involvement off. And at that point in time, we'll be more seen as an investor where you know, we are part of the, um, I guess, broader strategic team where you know, we'll be on the board, we'll be providing our insights through the board interactions more so than on the day-to-day -day operational level. Love it. Uh, so as we're getting closer to lunchtime and I'm getting hungry, I might be time to start wrapping up. But as a last question, I will ask everyone to tell us um, one piece of advice to a potential startup found, uh, founder in the biotech space. Like what is one thing that you think they should do and one thing that is a common mistake or something that they shouldn't do? Let's start with Benji. Hmm. Um, well, uh, I would say always beyond be willing always talk to people and just keep talking to as many people as you can about your idea you know gather the right team around you, you know in the spirit of today's topic right now on team gathering the right team around you is very important and you know, and team includes your 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 investors too right you know who are you who are you bringing around the table with you who are who are the co-founders are you bring around the table with you and as well as who will you be bringing on in terms of the the scientific staff that you're going to be working with day in, day out for a couple of years. So that's definitely something that founders should and always be on the lookout for and you know, constantly talk to people and to get a better sensing of how they should build the team. Lovely. Akbar, one do and one don't. I think uh, to me, uh, definitely mm, don't underestimate uh, uh, just having idea will give you the resource because from technical perspective we have this uh, very deep knowledge in technical side of things and then we are less aware of others piece of puzzle that there's market there's commercialization there's investment there's financial there's so many other pieces of course tech stays uh, in very big portion of it but it's not all so i think don't just um, uh, mislead yourself with just an idea that is good and it is working, but it may not be the best thing to do as a company. So need to discuss, need to read, need to think more. And definitely uh, to me, if you have a good complimentary uh, founder or partner that you can discuss with that person uh, and really idea, it can help in the early stages. But in the later stages to me for biotech, as I said, apart from very good team, the early founding team, you should have a way or at least path for IP. I see it very difficult if you don't have it clear, clarified or it's not there. So it's, it's not easy, I would say. At, at least it will slow you down significantly. Lovely. John, one do and one don't. I mean, our team is only 11 people, so I don't want to inflict anyone with advice i'm still learning myself but um i think one doers don't have any assumptions this is the same in science always but in the startup there's many many different kinds of assumptions like we're going to fundraise because of x or people will buy our product because of y you don't really know that until you've like actually gone and got a contract signed and people always want to say yes if you're like passionate and enthusiastic so don't drink your own kool-aid from your own pitches and sales you have to validate everything on the tech, on the business, on the people. Um, like, well, what was the question? You want something yeah, to do? And don't, something yeah, to don't. I only really have don'ts. Um, <laughs> I think uh, another don't I would say is like, don't fall prey to the zeitgeist of constant publicity. Don't waste heaps of time doing all these startup competitions and like posting stuff on LinkedIn every two days and all of these kind of things. At least for, for us, um, you know, we've fallen prey to that a little bit, but ultimately it's distracting. The only real progress is producing tech that someone's going to pay for. In the new investment climate we find ourselves in, investors are going to increasingly look for that. And these kind of soft KPIs won't, won't count for as much. So I think, uh, yeah, I would caution people against falling prey to the constant pressure of participating in competitions or do a lot of publicity. Lovely. Okay. Thank you, everyone. I had a nice uh, chat. I enjoyed the event. I hope uh, we are still friends after that and my difficult questions. <laughs> and uh, well, as we said uh, you, on the chat, there are many uh, much information about uh, both uh, Lightstone and Allozymes and the biotics they're hiring, looking for talents. 
and also please come to our events if you enjoyed this chat they will be more technical but uh, we'll have some nice things coming up in the near future so i'll pass the word to jean and have a goodbye from sg innovate who we will thank for hosting Thank you, Costas, and thank you all for the great sharing. Um, and to all our attendees uh, for your ongoing questions, it is always very heartening to see so much enthusiasm at our online sessions. Um, but real conversations often happen after, so we do hope that all of you can keep connected. Um, for startups founders looking for talent, as well as individuals looking to start a career in a deep tech startup, do take a look at some of the talent programs and platforms that SG Innovate has to offer by heading to our website, sginnovate.com. Uh, also, the recording of this session will be uploaded on SG Innovate's YouTube channel. So do head on there for a review of today's event. Until our next online event, thank you and goodbye, everyone.